We do hope you all enjoy tonight's show. Thank you. Before I heard the shot, I saw the gun, and at that moment, everything went quiet so that when the shooting started, that was all I could hear. That day was a normal day like any other. It was a Thursday at 7 in the morning, and I had just left my home early to visit my mother. I took the same precautions as every other day. I looked around to see if there was anyone suspicious hanging around, and I checked to see where the car was. I left my mother's house at 7.15, and I had my mobile phone in my right pocket, my keys in my left pocket. I crossed the street, and then I heard, psst, psst. I saw a very strange guy standing there with a cap, T-shirt, jeans, runners, and he had a rolled-up newspaper in his hand. I simply walked over because I thought he was just some guy in, a, in from the country, lost, looking for directions. I stopped barely two feet from him. We were facing each other. I have his image clearly etched in my mind. He put the paper down, took out a revolver, and started to fire. It was just a few seconds, 10 to 15 at most. Then I saw he was reloading the gun, and my immediate reaction was, dear God, how did I come to the end of my life like this? My life, watching the earth being dug, cut, mined, stripped, burned, deforested, contaminated, polluted, exploited. My life has not been my own since we started this struggle against the destruction of our environment. The struggle for environmental and social rights requires a spirit of commune with the earth, its bounty, and its people. We are not by ourselves, no, but all together in this struggle, and we are powerful being together. By acting in defense of these rights, these social and environmental rights, we are challenging the interests of powerful people. And when we challenge these people, they feel that their interests are threatened. And so they react and turn violent. And the risk is very, very high. The risk, the gun, the bullets, seven shots. On the same day I was shot, 50 other environmental activists in Guatemala received death threats. When I was in the hospital connected to 100 different tubes, my mother came to visit me. She said, mi hijo, you are not a liar, you are not a thief. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Get up and face the world and go on with your work. My flesh was torn and I had to be repaired, but my second life has begun. In Guatemala, we have a, a job to do, to speak for those who have no voice, to articulate for those who are prevented by the system, by the law, by disadvantage from communicating their experience. This is our job as human rights defenders. And my experience of surviving the assassination attempt that let me in intensive care for 68 days motivates me to tell you, we are not afraid, we will push ahead, we are right. Yes, they rob I sold I to the merchant ships. Many thought that they took I from the bottomless pit. And my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We have flowered in this generation triumphantly. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Is all I ever had redemption songs? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear of atomic energy Cause none of them can stop a time How long shall they kill our prophets 
while we stand aside and look. Some say it's just a part of it. You've got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Cause all I ever had redemption songs. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our minds Have no fear of atomic energy Cause none of them can stop at a time How long shall they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it They've got to fulfill the book won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? That's all I ever had. Redemption songs, all I ever had. Redemption songs, these songs of freedom, these songs of freedom. Redemption song. I live in exile in my own country, fighting against the ghost of homesickness. Some time ago, I was saying goodbye to my son, Jesus Luis. He was returning to finish his final year at university. I held him close and made him promise to look after himself. Before parting, I carried out the rite, which I always do when one of my children leaves. In front of the prayer corner, I give the blessing. It's the last image they keep of their home before leaving. As he walked away, I could see the fear in his eyes. I'm sure that the soldiers won't do anything to you, he said, to reassure me. But then quickly added, they can torture and kill me just to fuck with you. To reassure each other, we invented codes to communicate by telephone as far as the border. The border. Juarez. It's a dangerous place. The drug gangs, the corrupt police, and the lack of law and order have made Juarez the most dangerous city in the world. Women are kidnapped, raped, disappeared. Their bodies are dumped, mutilated and decapitated. And even for a lawyer like me, speaking out makes me a target. Every day I work to support families whose children have been taken. To make sure I can keep doing this work, to keep my own family safe, I've had to send them away. When my son left, I couldn't contain the tears. I remembered a similar scene 15 years ago. My son was barely six years old and we were walking happily along, hand in hand. Then he stopped suddenly, tightening my hand and said, Mama, those are the people who want to catch you. At that moment, I saw two police. I knelt down. I took him by the shoulders and said, My love, nothing is going to happen to me but I want to tell you something. If sometime they arrest me, please never think or let anyone tell you that I am a bad mother. The price I pay is very high. My three daughters, my son and my five grandchildren live far away from me. Not a day passes without me feeling overwhelmed by homesickness, knowing that I won't be there when they take their first steps or say their first words. Every year we promise to meet at Christmas in the family home where I keep the decorations which are never put up because nobody comes. It's not safe for anyone to come. Every year we all know there won't be any meeting. 
We fool ourselves in order to keep living in hope and make our situation more bearable. We tell ourselves, no, not this year, but definitely next year. Good evening. How are you? God, you're a very attractive audience. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Uh, what a great night to support a great organization. I'm very proud to hear that it's an Irish-born organization uh, for such a well-needed cause. And we have a great uh, tradition of human rights workers and activists in this country. There was a great man even uh, who comes from my own hometown, Ballyfermot, by the name of Tom Hyland. And uh, he used to drive the buses with my uncle. And they were, uh, you know, he, he, he became a very close family friend of ours. I used to sometimes meet off school and hang out in the office of his charity for uh, the East Timor Ireland Solidarity Campaign, it was. I, I wasn't learning much there, but anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, sing a song and dedicate it to all our great workers in this field. It's called Galileo. <laughs> As a Galilean boy, and he wondered what in heaven who invented such a joy. But the question got the better of his scientific mind, and to his blind and dying day, he looked up high. And often sigh and sometimes cry. Who puts the rainbow in the sky? Who lights the stars at night? Who dreamt up someone so divine? Someone like you and made them Love can make you ask some funny questions now and then But just remember the alternatives For I remember when And unhappy, and my lips were cold as ice. But you kissed me, and good heaven, now I'm here in paradise. So if ever I'm not kissing you or looking in your eyes. I won't be blind and I won't cry I'll look up high and gladly sigh And thank the guy who puts the rainbow in the sky Who lights the stars Who dreamt up someone so divine 
someone like you will make them mine. Someone like you will make them I am Liu Xiaobo, poet, teacher, writer, prisoner, 1458, in Jinju prison. The innocent souls of Tiananmen Square are yet to rest in peace. And I, who had been drawn into the path of dissidence by the passions of 4th of June 1989, lost the right to speak openly in my own country. I lost my podium, I lost the right to publish, and I lost the chance to speak publicly. And this was a sad thing, both for myself as an individual and for China. But I still want to tell the regime that deprives me of my freedom, I stand by the belief I expressed 20 years ago. I have no enemies and no hatred. And to my wife, Liu Jia, I am serving my sentence in a tangible prison while you wait in the intangible prison of the heart. Your love is the sunlight that leaps over high walls and penetrates the iron bars of my prison window, stroking every inch of my skin, warming every cell of my body, allowing me to always keep peace, openness and brightness in my heart and filling every minute of my time in prison with meaning. And my love for you on the other hand, is so full of remorse and regret that it at times makes me stagger under its weight. I am an incensed stone in the wilderness, whipped by fierce wind and torrential rain, so cold that no one dares touch me. But my love is solid and sharp, capable of piercing through any obstacle. Even if I were crushed into powder, I would still use my ashes to embrace you. Given your love, my sweetheart, I would face my forthcoming trial calmly, with no regrets about my choice, and looking forward to tomorrow optimistically. I look forward to my country being a land of free expression, where all citizens' speeches are treated the same, where different values, ideas, beliefs, political views, both compete with each other and coexist peacefully, where majority and minority opinions will be given equal guarantees. In particular, views different from those in power will be fully respected and protected, where all views will be spread in the sunlight for the people to choose, where all citizens will be able to express their political views without fear and will never be politically persecuted for voicing dissent. I hope to be the last victim of China's endless literary inquisition and that after this, no one else will ever be jailed for their speech. <laughs> The people, the army, we are one. The people, the army, we are one. Amir Behedi changed all that for me, and ultimately for Egypt. One evening, we were getting ready to leave Tahir Square, a group of us in two cars. We saw soldiers dragging a young protester away and beating him up behind the checkpoints. The army, the people, we are one. My mother insisted that we were not leaving without him. A couple of minutes later, he was released to us, but he had already been badly beaten. 
His name was Amir Behedi. We brought him away from the soldiers and checked he was okay. We took photos of his injuries so that we could file a complaint later. The army, the people, we are one. We left Amir with his cousin. A few minutes later, I got a call saying that the two boys had been arrested again at the other end of the street and that the police were charging them with the possession of weapons. But this was ridiculous. We had seen them just minutes before and knew that they were unarmed. Two days later, we found out that Amir had been brought before a military court and sentenced to five years in jail. The people, the army, we are one. While we had protests taking place in every square in the country with people chanting, the people and army, we are one, at the same time you had people being arrested, tried in a couple of minutes with no lawyers present, brutally tortured and given harsh sentences. At this point we realized that more and more of the protesters were being brought before the military courts. The people and army were definitely no longer one. We started sending out messages on Facebook and Twitter about who was in jail and calling for people to come and help. This was the beginning of the No Military Trials campaign. We figured out there were thousands of cases like Amir. We went out into the neighborhoods to tell people what we were doing about military trials and to give them the opportunity to tell their own stories. At the start, people still believed that the army had backed the revolution. They didn't want to acknowledge that the soldiers had been torturing civilians or that they had targeted the revolutionaries. From Tahrir, where the voices of people went out around the world, we found ourselves struggling to be heard. Families of the detained were voiceless and their loved ones locked away. The army said that they were rounding up criminals and protecting the revolution. But in reality, they were detaining the heroes of Tahrir. We visited their homes, collected their names, made posters and pictures, sent press releases, recruited lawyers and started protesting. People just couldn't ignore the thousands of faces of the revolutionaries. The arrests and the torture and the killings continued until we exposed that there were almost 12,000 people in detention. This created a palpable shock across the country and the army was forced to stop taking people away. For me, this whole journey started with the case of Amir Behedi. I felt responsible for him. When he was released to his family, they told him that there was this big campaign for him which had grown into a much bigger thing to help other people. He didn't believe it. He thought they were just trying to comfort him. From Amir Behedi to start with, we ended up finding 12,000 Amir Behedis and we are fighting to get them all released. <laughs> I was at the, uh, the launch of a book recently called The Atlas of the Irish Famine and uh, Mary Robinson was there giving a, uh, an introductory speech. Uh, another one of our great presidents, I might add. Great, great presidents. But uh, I thought she made a fantastic point uh, and she, she mentioned at one point that she thought that Irish people and Ireland was kind of uniquely positioned in the Western world to be able to empathize with and understand the causes of other nations in, in today's, you know, considering our own history and our recent past, relatively speaking, with the famine. I thought that was a great point. I happen to have a great interest in the subject. writing some songs about it, which I'd like to play one of those. This is called uh, Poor Boy's Shoes.
he met her at the dance She had flowers in her hair There was no girl in this land Who could have stood next to her there And there everyone could see How he loved her instantly Though he had nothing to give her But his poor boy's hopes and dreams Well, he danced with her that summer Till it showed on her sweet face As she was taken by the warmth of him And all his gentle ways Then he swore to her his love was true And he married her in poor boy's Well, not many years had passed Through the grip of his strong hands When a great unyielding hunger Drew its veil across this land His young love soon took ill And with two little mouths to fill It took all he could to keep them From the poor house on the hill But when his pockets had run dry From crying tears that rang like bells and their home drew in the wind just like an old seashell then he gathered everything he had to lose and he walked them up in poor boy's First God took the little boy Then he took the little girl And soon their little souls were free From all the sadness in this world Their father lifted up his love She could no longer walk alone From the poor house on the hill He took her on The long walk home As he laid her down to rest And so he knelt down by her bed And drew her feet up to his chest And there he tried to warm her cold feet through And they found him there in poor
three days. I'll never forget those three days. All of my human rights work, all our efforts to make peace between the Kyrgyz and the Uzbek communities gone. The violence spread fast, faster than anyone could imagine. And when the army joined the attacks against the Uzbeks, everyone ran. Over 80,000 people, mostly women, children, and the elderly fled to the border. I ran to help the women and children fleeing. I ran to try to meet with the local leaders and restore calm. And then I stopped running and slept. They came for me in the morning. The same police and corrupt officials I had spent years exposing for the sake of justice. They took me in for questioning. And the first one said to me, people trust you, Asimjan. Now you write who you saw handing out those machine guns. I'll give you their names. Write what you saw them doing as they were giving out at least five machine guns. They were trying to destroy my credibility, but I refused and said, how can I describe something that I did not see? Suddenly I was hit in the back of the head with the butt of a gun and my blood spurted out like a fountain and covered the floor of the office. And that, the, the sight in my left eye became dimmed. The policeman started yelling at me, clean it up. I started to clean it up with the tail of my shirt while they beat me harder and harder. One of the policemen tried to stop them. He said, what are you doing? Yesterday when this old man came to the station, you shook his hands and now you're beating him? But the others took no notice. I was placed in a cell with bars in the door. As policemen passed, each one would wave me over. Then suddenly they would punch me in the face so hard that I bounced off the cell wall. For three days I was beaten, punched, kicked, humiliated. And then I was taken for questioning. A policeman stood on either side of me, and each time I denied a charge, they punched me in the side of the stomach. Then I was charged with killing a policeman. They took me to see the deputy prosecutor, Jamila. She picked up a book and said, Azimjan, this is the book you always carried, the book you used in your complaints against policemen when you asked me to prosecute them. Well, this book closes here. There is another code in this building. At that point, they took me back to the station, and the beatings continued. Eventually, I was brought to trial and convicted. Even the state's own ombudsman acknowledged that the charges were purely political and there was no evidence, but the framing was complete. I had worked all my life exposing police and judicial corruption. Now I was serving a life sentence. They can jail me, they can destroy my life, but how can I tell them what I did not see? Fantastic. What a night. Anyways, uh, great to be back here again. I grew up just around the corner here, have we? We went through the front door, hang a right, the first wall on the right. That was us. The ivy bush there. Sing this with me. Will help be do, young Willie McBride. Do you mind if I sit here down by your graveside and rest for a while? Need a warm summer sun. I've been walking all day and I'm nearly done. I see by our gravestone you were only nineteen when you joined the great father in nineteen sixteen. I hope you died well and I hope you died clean. Young Willie, my friend, was it slow and obscene? Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fife loudly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? And did the band play the last post and chorus? 
to the flames. Play the flowers of the fall. Did you leave it a wife for a sweet time behind you? In some faithful heart is your memory enshrined. Although you died back in 1916, in that faithful heart I am forever 19. Or are you a stranger without even a name, enclosed and forever behind the glass frame? In an old photograph, torn, battered, and stained, and faded to yellow in a brown leather frame, singing, Did he beat the drum slowly? And the day sound the death march as they lowered you down. Did the band play the last post and chorus? And did the pipes play the flowers of the fall? The sun, there were chimes on these green fields. Of France. There's a warm summer's breeze, it makes the red poppies dance. And look how the sun shines from under the clouds. There's no gas, no barbed wire, and there's no gun firing now. But here in this graveyard, it's still no man's land. All the countless white crosses stand mute in the sand. Do man's blind indifference to his fellow man. To a whole generation that were butchered and damned. Did they beat the drum slowly? And did they sound the death march? As the law you down, did the band play the last post and chorus? And did the pipes play the flowers of the fall? A young woody, my bride, I can't help but wonder why. To those that lay here, no, why did they die? And did they believe when they answered the call? Did they really believe that this war would end once? The sorrow, the suffering, the glory, the pain, all the kidding and dying was all done in vain. Young Willie McBride, it all happened again. And again, and again, and again, and again. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they sound the death march? And did the band play the last pause? Fuck you.
the day be the drum slowly did it play the five lonely the day sound the dead march as the lava are down and did the band play the last pause and chorus did the place play the flowers of the fall Sing this with me. This is. I remember when this song came out when I was a kid uh, in the sixties, and it, it absolutely blew me away. It goes, how many roads must a man walk there before you call him a man? How many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sun? How many times must a cannonball fly before it's forever bad? Oh, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing. How many tears can the mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head, pretend he just doesn't see? It's blowing in the wind, the answer is blowing in the wind. How many times can a man look up before he sees the sky? How many years must one man have before he can hear people? How many deaths will it take till we know that too many people have died? What the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Sing with me. How many roads must a man walk? Before you go to man, how many white girls say before she can sleep in the sun? How many times must the cannonball fly before it's Patriot, 4th of October 2012, Zimbabwe's notorious sellouts, 
looking out for sellouts in our midst. Every time the name Magoobwins across the board want to vomit. This is because the infamous Magoo played a leading sellout role in the fight by Western imperialists to prevent our country, Zimbabwe, from selling its diamonds on the international markets. Why? Because the British and the Americans want their companies to do the mining and nobody else. And Magoo agrees with them. And who is this Magoo? Why, that's me. The government says I work for these Western interests who want to control our diamond trade. The same government that sent troops to take control of the, di of the diamond fields. The same government that fired live ammunition from helicopter gunships, killing over 100 miners and injuring hundreds more. The same government that wants to expose me as a sellout for my human rights work that threatens their interests and stranglehold on power. After the government's ruthless takeover of the diamond fields, I went to the mortuary to take pictures of the victims. I wanted to attract the attention of the international community and help stop the violence. When I first began to track the levels of violence in Marange, I knew the risks would be high. People who challenge the official propaganda are seen as enemies of the state. I was accused of exposing the violence to a diamond industry monitor and undermining the economic interests of the country. This is why they label me a sellout. I am the youngest of six children. My next oldest brother, Itai, he and I were very close. He was assassinated in July 2000 for pushing for a return to real democracy. And his killing crushed me. But it also inspired me to stand up and speak out against violence and injustice. It took away my fear. The government has assaulted my family, placed me under surveillance, put me in jail, stopped me from leaving the country, confiscated my documents, infiltrated my organization, and now this, Zimbabwe's notorious sellout. The sellout in our midst. Anything to stop the truth from coming out.
dear Merva and Nima, I love you both very much. I wish you happiness and prosperity like any other parent. I consider you first in every decision I make. Receiving visits from you is very important to me. I suffer from not having held you for months. I am in pain from not hearing your voices. I will not be able to see you this week as I have had my visiting privileges revoked. I was told that I was being disciplined for refusing to wear the hijab during visits. So I am banned from the Monday visits for three weeks. My beloved ones, whether I like it or not, my actions now will be judged by you one day. But these actions are not what I wear in this prison. They're what I do to defend women, children, and those who express their opinion against the government. In the last decade, Iran has led the world in executing juveniles. As a lawyer, when I take these cases and go to court, our defense is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Iran signed 40 years ago. Article 37 prohibits the execution of individuals under the age of 18, as does the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But the courts show no regard for these international and moral obligations. My generation spent its childhood in an era where people would not be hanged for what they did when they were young. We knew that no one our age would face the hanging judge or any other method of terrifying punishment. They knew we were children and would never send us to the gallows. Today in Iran, girls on their 10th birthday and boys on their 16th birthday are considered by the law to be adults. We see here how the laws clearly conflict with Iran's international obligations. I will never forget Nimat, who was hanged when he was 17. He was arrested when he was 15. He insisted on his innocence. Only after he was taken into custody and interrogated, undoubtedly beaten and mistreated, only then did he confess. There are many problems for a society in which children are treated as adults. Amongst all the various issues we struggle for, women's rights, freedom of expression, freedom of association, this execution of children keeps me awake in the dead of night. As a mother, I cannot but think of my own children when I defend other children. Sometimes I wonder, will the new generation of children in a country where the law punishes them as adults ever stand in solidarity for other children's rights in the future? Murva and Nima, my beloved children, next to all my social and professional identities, I am proud of being a mother, especially to you two. Being a mother is always on my mind. As I strive for an Iran where justice prevails, I declare loud and clear, I am a mother. I know that you require water, food, housing, a family, parents, love, and visits from your mother. However, just as much you need freedom social security, the rule of law and justice. Please be aware that these concepts have not been easily achieved anywhere in the world. Nowhere in the world was the law upheld when written on torn sheets of paper. Our insistence on the rule of law is what brings the law into being. Thus, you should know that you and I 
of forming and building the law together. I kiss you thousands of times. I suffer from not having held you in months. And I hope that the suffering is not in vain. I love you both. Nazreen.
Well, I hope that um, I hope that some of you aren't disappointed that Keila aren't here. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it tonight, and I was asked to stand in. So I hope that's okay. I have to say, um, it's an absolute honour to be here um, to be performing for Frontline. They're absolutely an amazing organisation. I've just been finding out more and more and more about them as the evening goes on, and uh, I'm just blow blown away by the work they do. And as I say, I'm really honoured to be here. But I'd love if you would help us to do this next song. I think the couple of songs that I'm going to do for you tonight, I think, are fairly appropriate to the night that's in it. And um, I'd love if you would help us sing this song. This is a song that, if you do sing, to sing it for all the people, men, women and children, who suffer the injustice that goes on in this world. So here goes. The higher you build your barrier taller I become The farther you take my rights away The faster I will run You can deny me You can decide To turn your face away No matter cause there's There's something inside so strong Know that I can make it Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong You thought that my pride was gone Oh no Something inside so strong There's something inside so strong The more you refuse to hear my voice The louder I will sing you hide behind walls of Jericho All lies come tumbling Denied my place in time You squandered world that's mine Our light will shine so bright Because there's, there's something inside so strong I know that I can make it Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong you thought that my pride was gone, oh no There's something inside so strong There's something inside so strong Brothers and sisters, when they insist we just not good enough Yes, we know better, just look up in the eye we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna do it anyway. There's something inside so strong. I know that I can make it. Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong. You thought that my pride was gone. Oh, no. There's something inside so strong. There's something inside so strong. Brothers and sisters, when they insist we're just not good Yes, we know better. Just look them in the eye and say, we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna do it anyway. Gonna do it anyway. We're gonna do it anyway. Something inside so strong. I know that I can make it. Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong You thought that my pride was gone Oh no There's something inside so strong There's something inside so strong So strong I know that I can make it Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong You thought that my pride was gone Oh no There's something inside so strong something inside so strong There's something inside so strong There's something
something inside so strong. I'm going to try an unaccompanied song for you now. This is, um, again, as I say, it's a song that I think sums up the night that's in it. It's a uh, a song that was written by a wonderful man called Owen McCall. As I say, it's an unaccompanied song. He wrote this song, I suppose, for him to, th because he, he, he was actually born in England, but he always looked on himself as Scottish. And he wrote this song about England, but I kind of changed the words to suit Ireland. But in actual fact, it's a song that's universal and it could happen for any, any country in the world. And it's a song that talks about injustice and what's legal and what's illegal, and uh, I really hope you like it. Here goes. Every time you pick up a newspaper, every time you switch on the TV, you can bet your old boots that at some point you'll see a high-ranking banker or else a TD. Calling on all who are meant to be free To stand up and defend law and order It's illegal to rip off a payroll It's illegal to hold up a train But it's illegal to rip off a million or two that comes from the labors that other folk do to plunder the many on behalf of a few. It's a thing that is perfectly legal. It's illegal to kill off your landlord or to trespass upon his estate. But to charge a high rent for a slum is okay. To condemn two adults and three children to stay. In a hovel that's rotten with damp and decay It's a thing that is perfectly legal It's illegal if you are a traveller To camp by the side of the road But it's proper and right for the rich and the great To live in a mansion and own an estate That was got from the people by pillage and rape well that's what they call a tradition if your job turns you into a zombie then it's legal to feel some despair but don't get aggressive and don't get too smart for Christ's sake don't upset the old apple cart remember your boss has your interests at heart and it grieves him to see you unhappy if you fashion a bomb in your kitchen then you're guilty of breaking the law but a bloody great nuclear plant is okay and plutonium processing hastens the day when this small little isle will be blasted away nonetheless it is perfectly legal it's illegal to kill off your missus or put poison in your old man's tea. But poison the rivers, the seas and the skies and poison the minds of a nation with lies. It's all in the interest of free enterprise. Nonetheless, it is perfectly legal. It's illegal to sing on the telly but make bloody sure that you don't to sing about racists or fascists or creeps or those in high places who live off the weak and those who are selling us right up the creek the twisters the takers the con men the fakers the whole bloody gang of Exploiter. <laughs> Thank you.
I've been an actor all my life. In fact, I have no conscious memory of ever not being an actor. But while acting is what I do for a living, activism is what I do to stay alive. And so naturally, and of course, that's what drew me to frontline defenders. This extraordinary nonviolent human rights organization has worked tirelessly to protect human rights activists at risk in 70 countries around the world since 2001. These activists are people with the courage to change the world, people who speak out when they see injustice, who stand at the side of the oppressed and challenge the power of the dictators and the tyrants and the greed of the unscrupulous multinationals and the corrupt governments who do their bidding. People who truly believe that words like dignity, justice, and equality can actually take human form and make a huge difference in people's lives and culture. People who work far from the media spotlight and often live on the run, never knowing when they leave one place in the morning if they will return safely to some other place that night. People who risk their lives every day defending the rights of others and protecting the environment. People who deeply embody the old adage, one heart with courage is a majority. Each time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and injustice. Those words were spoken at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, at the height of apartheid, 1963, by Senator Robert Francis Kennedy. They are inscribed on his memorial at Arlington National Cemetery as well. And they have been a powerful source of inspiration and nourishment for my generation ever since. If I like girls, why shouldn't I be able to show it to the world that this is the person that I love, this is the person I want to share my life with? It's the laws that are making people hateful. It's the religion, the culture that shaped us that is making people so hateful. Because when you talk to people on the streets of Kampala, they will tell you that they want homosexuals to be killed. They will tell you that they want homosexuals to be imprisoned. So I ask, have you ever met an openly gay man or lesbian? And they answer, no. So why do you hate them? It's because my class teacher said it's not good. Or because my friends say it's against the law. Or my preacher in church says it's a sin. So they hate because they've been told to hate. And others, I think it's just fear. Recently, my mother passed away. Everyone in my family blames me. They say she worried that I was going to be killed. But my mother was very supportive. She didn't care what I was doing or who I loved, any of that stuff. She was rejected by many people because she accepted me. She used to keep telling us, just protect yourselves, just be safe, be safe. I live an openly gay life and that has brought me a lot of trouble. Expelled from three schools, suspended from two others, even the university. I wasn't trying to challenge the system by coming out. I simply did it because I was innocent. I didn't really understand that this was illegal to be gay or that it could lead to a life impris imprisonment. The tabloids started a hate campaign against us exposing people's names, their pictures, where they work, some were married. On the front page of one of the rags, the headline screamed, hang them, hang them. After that article, people used to wait for us outside our bar. Threats escalated. Many people got raped. People were attacked on their way home. There was one time I was even chased by guys on motorbikes. They wanted to teach me how to be a proper woman. 
Articles kept coming. Hang them. They're after your children. We went to court, and against all odds, we won the case against the tabloid, but the violence hasn't stopped. Three months after the court case, my friend David was beaten to death with a hammer in his home. The government was the first to say that David Cato's killing was not a hate crime. They didn't even wait for the investigation. They didn't even wait for the trial to start. David used to save people. He used to bail people out of prison. People he didn't even know. People arrested for just being gay. David is gone and we may never get justice. Now the government even wants to sanction our killing by making homosexuality a crime punishable by death. Here in Uganda, we are trying to make a safe place for us. But some of us may not even live to see the liberation we are fighting for today. But there is hope. At least there is hope. My father told me When I was but a child Learning to speak He gave me song in my mother country My mother language and that is the language And by this I know that the wealth of a country is in its people. And their relationship with the land and the beings Take one last look, for it is gone. These faces speak for us. It is gone. And was so shout all the wellum is the her she swas team shafarier the hours last was tis no bar timor 
Da vein she counts for your gentle da vein she reaches time time lag scam for the Is back my winter ago. I wish I had you in Carrick for girls. Ni fadonachin go balier Sailing over the deep blue ocean, and yet more rock, she a gallon. But the seas, they are deep, love, and I can swim. Very over my love and I
Tell me, what do you do when you can no longer do what you've been doing all your life? What you learned from your father and your grandfather? I'm a fisherman in Guanabara Bay, near Rio de Janeiro, but maybe not for too much longer. Nothing has been the same since more than a million liters of oil leaked into the bay. Our waters are now the prize for the national oil company Petrobas, which is saturating the area with construction sites and terminals, building a gas pipeline. The companies claim to have a social environment responsibility, but they know what's going on and they don't take any action. The Clean Bay project is just for PR. And we're not here to clean up after them. We're up against a multi-million dollar construction business, and we are just poor fishermen. We need this sea to eat and to pay our bills. They're constantly trying to drive fishermen from the bay, but this is our bay. So we organized with the other fishermen of the area to demonstrate and to try to pressure local officials. In one demonstration, we were able to gather up to 100 men on their boats to protest. And when we are all together, we're strong, and they don't make any direct threats. But when we go back home, when we go back to our routine, that's when the threats start. June 22nd was not a good day. Initially, when Almir and Pituca went missing, we weren't immediately alarmed, even though they'd already killed two other fishermen, Paolo and Marcos. But they didn't just kill Pituca and Almir. It was barbaric and cruel. They tied up our friends and left them to drown. They were drowned by the water that flows from the Guandashiba River, the very river we were trying to save, the environment we're trying to preserve. They were in the way of a fucking pier. They are chasing us, hunting us, killing us. They kill us and we bury our friends. And when we bury them, a little bit of ourselves goes with them. But we will not be driven out of our homes on Guanabara Bay. The choice is simple. Either we impose our will and survive, or we leave things as they are and use our boats as firewood to cook our last meal on the beach. Good evening, everybody. How are you? What a great evening. This is a song about what happens when we're making plans. Johnny's got high expectations He's gonna rise And everyone knows that Johnny is ready He's ready to fly Up on the rooftop he turns to the crowd No one is waiting No one is there Nobody knows why Elvis Threw it all away Nobody knows what Ruby had to hide Nobody knows why some of us Get broken hearts some of us find a world that's clear and bright You could be packed up and ready Knowing exactly where to go How come you miss a connection? No use in asking The answer is nobody knows 
No use in asking the answer and nobody knows Johnny will keep his illusions What else can he do? That it would be different If it happened to you But up on the rooftop It's a whole other world And who could see heaven And now want to stay Nobody knows why Elvis threw it all away. Nobody knows why Ruby had to hide her. Nobody knows why some of us get broken hearts. And some of us find a world that's clear and bright. You could be packed up and ready. Knowing exactly where to go How come you miss a connection? No use in asking The answer will nobody knows Yeah, no use in asking The answer will nobody knows mm, The answer will nobody knows this one. They say the skies are up Lebanon are burning those mighty cedars bleeding in the heat They're showing pictures on the television Women and children dying in the street I we stood out it in our own place Still trying to reach the future through the past Still trying to carve tomorrow from a tombstone But hey, don't listen to me Cause this wasn't meant to be no sad song We've heard too much of that before Right now I only want to be here with you Till the morning dew comes forth I want to take you to the island And trace your footprints in the sand And in the evening when the sun goes down We'll make love to the sound of the ocean They're raising banners over by the markets Whitewashing Slogans on the shipyard walls 
witch doctors praying for a mighty showdown. No way a holy flag is gonna fall. Up here we sacrifice our children to feed the worn out dreams of yesterday and teach them dying will lead them into glory. But hey, don't listen to me, cause this wasn't meant to be no sad song. I've sung too much of that before Right now I only want to be here with you Till the morning dew comes fall I want to take you to the island And trace your footprints in the sand And in the evening We'll make love to the sound of the ocean. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. The atmosphere in the square was amazing. Everyone from Genesin was there, sleeping, cooking, singing. The strike started at the refinery, but moved to the center of the town, across the street from the headquarters of the gas company, one of the largest in Kazakhstan. For over a year, the company had been neglecting us and withholding our salaries. Our families were really struggling to make ends meet. When we started demanding our rights, no one thought it would get this big. But our union had been organizing for many years, and we were determined to not let the company continue to exploit us. Genesin was a town set up for oil workers. It is in the desert, far away from anything. Over the years, the company made a lot of money, but the town is still basic. Maybe we trusted the authorities for too long. Maybe we didn't think we could speak up and demand our rights. But that all changed in 2011. We surprised the company. We surprised the authorities. We even surprised ourselves. But there was a big price to pay. We lost our jobs. 
Our comrades were brought into court and families struggled to eat and survive. Some were even killed. Still, the spirit of our community was strong and we believed we could get our rights. From the start, I would call the local and international media to try to make sure that they knew what was happening in Janazin. I became the voice of the strikers. On the 16th of December, in the middle of a cold winter, the authorities decided to celebrate Kazakh Independence Day in the square. This had never happened before. So why did they suddenly, out of the blue, decide to celebrate in our square when we were there in the middle of our strike? They couldn't hold the event without clearing the square. And clearing the square meant pushing out the strikers. We never thought the government would do it. Never thought they would use force against us for asking for our basic rights from the company. The troops moved in and they started to clear the square. People were being rounded up, pushed, hit and beaten. Then the security forces opened fire. Dozens were killed and many more injured. It was hard to tell how many exactly. I tried to look after others, but we had to get to safety. I was stunned. I felt dead inside. I couldn't talk. I couldn't believe what was happening. Journalists had been blocked by the security forces from coming to the town. So I called the ones I knew and told them about the crackdown. This was our only connection to the outside world. They came for me at home, and I was arrested along with 37 other strikers. During my interrogation, a man standing behind me put a gun to my head while someone else in the room said, kill her. A young man called Ruslan, with a scar on his face, tortured me. He put a plastic bag over my head and I lost consciousness. They ripped out my hair. They wanted to silence me. And so I'm here now in jail, seven years reduced to five on appeal. My entire family has been put under pressure. Last summer, my daughter Alia was arrested on charges of assaulting a fellow co-worker and held for seven days. They are trying to take my house, my children. The events in Janazen became a symbol, a terrible, tragic symbol but also something that cannot be ignored. Everyone in the country knows Janazin and knows what happened here. Good evening. I have a lament for you, first of all. I, I wonder what is keeping my true love tonight. I wonder what is keeping you out of my sight for as little all you know I'm happy and I endure or you wouldn't stay from me this night I am Oh, love, are you coming, our cause to advance? Oh, love, are you waiting for a far better chance? You know you have my whole life placed by yours in store. 
And I just can't bear to think that I'll kiss you no more For sometimes we loved lightly But more times we loved long And when I think about you I know where I belong Last night you said you loved me And it put my world at ease Now you're far from me I come home, darling, please Green grass, it grows bonny Still waters run clear I am weary and I'm lonesome for the loss of my dear. You were my first and only true love, and lately I knew that the fonder I loved you, the closer we grew. Oh, I wonder what is keeping my true love tonight. I wonder what is keeping you out of my sight. For it's little, you know, the pain I endure. You wouldn't stay from me this night, I am sure. No, you wouldn't stay from me this night, I am sure. Thanks so much. So honored to be here, Vicar Street, bringing voice to the voiceless. Did you bring your voices by any chance? This one is by popular request. Put the message in the box. Put the box into the car. Drive the car around the world until you get her. And if you listen now, you may hear a new sound coming in as the old one disappears. See the world in just one grain of sand. You better take a closer look. Don't let it slip right through your hand. Won't you please hear the call? The world says, come on. Put the message and put the box. Drive the car round the world until you get her. And now is the moment. Please understand. The road is wide open to the heart of every man. A few simple words that he could understand. You don't want tomorrow if it's just crumbling into sand. Won't you please hear the call? The world says, put the message in the box. Put the box into the car. Drive the car round the world until you get and the world says, give a little bit, give a little bit of your love to me. Cause I'm waiting right here with my open arms. She says, give a little bit, give a little bit of your soul to me. Cause I'm waiting to behold your many charms. Is that love in the air? 
says, come on. Put the message in the box. Put the box into the car. Drive the car around the world until you get hurt. Put the message. Put the box. And drive the car around the world until you Very much. Good night. When human rights blogger and my dear friend Abdeli Mam was released from prison. It was both a victory for us and a signal we hoped that things were changing. Nabli, Ali, and I marched in front of a huge crowd heading to Pearl Roundabout to celebrate the releases. At Pearl, the atmosphere was like a circus. Thousands of families were out sharing in the excitement. In Tunisia and Egypt, we had seen our brothers and sisters succeed, and we felt finally this was our moment, our time to bring the Arab Spring to Bahrain. I had been working for this moment all of my life, from inside Bahrain, from exile in Denmark, and even from inside prison. I had been campaigning to see full human and political rights being a reality for all Bahrainians, not just the ruling family and their friends. Inspired by events in the region, mobilized by the campaigns on Facebook and Twitter, this time the protests were huge and stronger than ever. Even when they tried to break us up and disperse the crowd from the roundabout, we refused to give up our space, and we took it back the next day. It was only when the regime brought in Saudi soldiers, foreign troops, and declared martial law that, we were able to, that they were able to take the roundabout. The movement reorganized in all the villages in the country, and then the clampdown came, and they came for me in the middle of the night. All I remember is lying on the ground trying to protect my head from their boots. I heard shouting and screaming, but the beating came, kept coming. It was hard to breathe. I felt pain everywhere. My mouth wouldn't work. Then, black. I have no regrets. It's a serious business addressing issues such as corruption, inequality, and discrimination, challenging the interests of the ruling family, documenting arbitrary detention and torture by the national security apparatus. So as much as it was unfair, it was no surprise when I was initially detained in 2004, severely beaten until uh, during peaceful protests in 2005 and 6, and subjected to unfair trials, travel bans, and continuous defamation campaigns. What else would you expect from these people? Because of the beatings that night when they came for me, my face is now held together by metal plates and screws. I've been tortured and threatened with rape by the prison guards. In court, I wasn't even allowed to defend myself or to present evidence of the abuse. They tried to silence me, but I refused to be gagged, to let them take away my voice. But I've had to pay a heavy price. I'm now serving a life sentence. My family has had to pay a price, too. My dear and beloved family, from behind prison walls, I send to you my love and my yearning. From a free man to a free family, these prison walls don't separate me from you. They bring us closer together. Our connection and determination is stronger than ever. Zenab and Miriam, my beloved daughters, when I see the courage with which you continue to stand up to this brutal regime, I realize my struggle has not been in vain, and our struggle will prevail. While it's true, I am here and you are out there, but our pain is made more bearable when we remember that we chose this difficult path and took an oath to remain true. Okay, I um, wonder if you can help a little bit with this one. Your cue will come, but I'm just gonna teach you the words, simple words. It's just this, it goes. Strong, 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 stronger than strong, strong, 
strong, can I hear you? Strong, 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 stronger than strong, 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 stronger than strong, strong, strong. Okay, we're there. Somebody told me your spirit had gone. Worn down by a cynical world Had it stolen your glow Somebody told me You know You know If it don't kill you It'll make you strong And I wish I was close I would wrap my loving arms around you But I'm not and all I've got are my platitudes Songs and the hopes that you make it through Somebody told me, you know Don't you know If it don't kill you It'll make you strong If it don't kill you It'll make you strong I tried to remember Was such a long time ago When we were forever You said we'd always go on being stronger, stronger than strong We'll be stronger than strong Now somebody told me Your spirit had gone But I don't believe it's true Cause it was you who said the spirit goes on and on Strong, 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 stronger than strong, 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 stronger than strong, 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 stronger than strong, yeah, mm -hmm. stronger than strong, yeah, strong, I am Yuri Malini, and I am a human rights defender. I am Lucha Castro. I'm a human rights defender. I am Lu Xiaobo. I am a human rights defender. I am Mona Saif. I am a human rights defender. I am Azam John Askarov, and I am a human rights defender. I am Farai Maguwu. I am a human rights defender. I am Nazrin Satude. I am a human rights defender. I am Kasha Nabagasera. I am a human rights defender. I am Alexander Anderson. I am a human rights defender. I am Rosa Tulateva. I am a human rights defender. I am Abduhali Al Kawasa, and I am a human rights defender. Strong, strong, strong. Stronger and strong, 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 stronger and stronger, 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 stronger and strong, yeah, strong, stronger and strong, yeah, strong, stronger and strong, yeah, strong. We'd be stronger than strong.
Oh, you are. Yeah. Speaking of strong, I'm deeply honored to introduce the strongest person I know, the founder of this organization. Please welcome Mary Lawler. Hello, everybody. President Higgins, you're very welcome. Ambassadors and everybody here, thank you all. First of all, I just want to thank the extraordinary artists that we heard tonight. Weren't they amazing? <laughs> and in particular, I want to thank our jet-lagged special envoy, Martin Sheen, who came all the way from Los Angeles. <laughs> And our other envoy, Andrea, who has done so much for us over the years. I want to thank all the people who contributed to making this night a great success, working hard behind the scenes. And in particular, uh, well, I'm not going to be particular, but they all know who they are. <laughs> So thank you very much. It's great for us as, a, as an, an NGO to see all of you here. So thank you all very much for coming and for supporting uh, the event tonight. Without you, of course, we wouldn't have had an event. So thank you for the support. The stories you heard tonight are just a few of the hundreds of cases of human rights defenders that we're in daily contact with on, and on whose behalf we work for. So, I mean, that's why we need your support because this is basically what we do. And you might know that the event was being live streamed tonight and last Friday we got uh, an email from a woman human rights defender. We sent. We sent it out to 10,000, actually, of our contacts, including all the human rights defenders around the world, to ask them if they wanted to join us online. But uh, Natalie, a woman human rights defender from Eastern Congo who is under death threat because of her work and we had to move her to safety, she wrote us an email and she said, thank you for the invitation. If we survive the war, we will follow the show from Goma where we are with your help. So bon courage, Natalie. We dedicate this show to all those brave human rights defenders around the world. So I just say good night and safe journey home.
Why you hesitate when someone asks your name? But though 